Thank you so much uh, for that welcome, and thank you for the introduction. I, I'm absolutely honored to be here and to be included with such amazing speakers. Um, I'm up here, at least in part, because I have a unique story. And as I've shared my story more and more on campus here, I've found that it raises certain questions that are of interest to so many of us who are working toward the future of healthcare. And so I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of my story with all of you. And my hope is, is that we can all leave here today with a few questions about the role of fear and shame in our efforts as we move forward with HIV. To start, I am HIV positive. And that in and of itself is not necessarily that unique. There are about 34 million people around the world living with that diagnosis. But my journey with HIV from the start and where it has taken me is perhaps a little bit different and perhaps of interest of, an interest to people here today. Back in 2008, I was serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine. And I was 25 at the time. I was teaching English to a bunch of Ukrainian teenagers because that helps promote peace, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> I was unaware. <laughs> and I absolutely loved the experience. Uh, peace promoting or not, I got to connect with these students on a daily basis. I got to connect with uh, an amazing town filled with people that I had never known before and were from a different culture, and it was absolutely amazing every day. I have no doubt that I would have finished my 27-month commitment with Peace Corps. But on January 10th, 2008, I was offered an HIV test as part of a mid-service medical exam. And to my surprise, it came back positive. My initial emotional response was perhaps what you might expect. I had some fear come up around my health. I knew that there was treatment, but I wasn't exactly sure what it meant for my health more generally. I had a lot of fear around what people would think about me, what my father would think about me, what my friends would think about me, and some shame started to come up within me. But even within that moment, my number one fear turned out to be whether or not I could finish my service and connect back with my students. It was incredibly important to me that I not have to retreat home simply because of this. Unfortunately, the Peace Corps decided to medically evacuate me to Washington, D.C. And there I learned that it was Peace Corps policy to dismiss people who tested positive for HIV. They said that, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> they said that I couldn't finish my service because I wouldn't be able to complete my duties as a volunteer because of my illness, and that they wouldn't be able to take care of me in a foreign setting. The fear that I had amplified tremendously. I suddenly had this fear that I was now so undesirable and so useless that I couldn't even finish my volunteer commitment to my students. And some shame started to really come up for me. I started to feel like I was being punished, and there was part of me that wondered if on some level I didn't deserve it. It connected with something in my mind from growing up gay in a conservative community, where I had learned that on some level I was bad, and that on some level these sorts of things happened to bad people like me. But fortunately, I had a lot of support at the time, including support from an, an amazing friend who pointed out to me that I had done nothing wrong, that I was living my life the best way that I could, and that I was trying to do some good things with my life and help people. He also pointed out to me that I had no physical symptoms from HIV, and so I was being discriminated against. Now, if any of you are ever going to be discriminated against, I recommend that you have it happen while you're in Washington, D.C., because <laughs> It's absolutely the best place for it to happen. <laughs> it was amazing. I, I actually walked two blocks down the street from Peace Corps headquarters and found a national HIV AIDS advocacy organization that was, <laughs> that was all too happy to put me in contact with some legal counsel. And so I ended up getting in contact with the ACLU, or the American Civil Liberties Union. And 
they offered to represent me legally in order to try and overturn Peace Corps' policy. They offered to threaten a lawsuit, and they offered to issue a national press release in which I would be named. At this point, my level of fear went up by about a factor of a million, <laughs> and I was very concerned about having to take this new persona on a national level. I was unsure of how to be this HIV positive person, unsure of how to be an activist, and all of a sudden, this was going to be plastered all over the United States. But again, I had so much support at this time, including support from a doctor who was always quick to make me feel comfortable, always treated me as a partner in my health, and never, ever shamed me, or and never made me feel afraid. So I agreed to this giant mess of a <laughs> press release. And within a short amount of time, the shit hit the fan. <laughs> I was featured in the Washington Post, the Denver Post, which is a big deal if you're from Denver like me. <laughs> and I ended up on the cover of Paws Magazine, which is a magazine that deals with all things related to HIV. And I, of course, really dislike the photo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I look like I'm smelling something really foul. <laughs> but it only went out to about 180,000 people, so no big. It's totally OK. So um, the Peace Corps felt pressure right away. And the Peace Corps started to defend their policy. But fortunately, and to my surprise, within two months, the Peace Corps stopped defending their policy and decided to overturn it. And so nowadays, if you test positive for HIV and you're a Peace Corps volunteer, you can continue your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as you can imagine, it was very empowering. It was a truly empowering experience. But it didn't entirely undo all of the damage that had come about from all of the fear and shame that I felt during that process. At one point, my story actually ended up on a Fox News website, and some of the commentary that was posted showed a lot of judgment and showed a lot of fear and a lot of shame. And that was from people who didn't even know me. And so I became fascinated with this phenomenon of fear and shame around HIV. And I wanted to know how this actually affected other people living with this virus. And that eventually led me to get a job as a case manager at the Northern Colorado AIDS Project. And while I was there, I had the privilege of working with an amazing group of people who happened to be living with HIV. I had the honor of helping them connect to services that they desperately need. And I saw these wonderful individuals try to deal on a regular basis with so much fear around their health, so much shame from their communities, so much shame from their friends and from their family, and the secrecy that that drove. And I began to want to understand what was being done to try and protect people from this same type of fear and shame that I had experienced. I wanted to understand what was being done on a national level to allow these people to live with dignity and live full lives. And so, in part of trying to discover this, I applied to the Mailman School of Public Health in order to get my master's, and I actually got in. <laughs> I packed up my moving truck, I drove all the way across the country all by myself. I felt so tough. <laughs> and then I actually managed to park in Manhattan, which made me feel really tough. <laughs> it was amazing. And I found everything that I wanted in my school. I got to meet so many amazing professors, like Dr. Fulalove, and so many others out there who presented this avant-garde body of evidence that seemed to really definitively show that HIV stigma and fear and shame continues to drive this epidemic and does immeasurable harm to people living with HIV and those most at risk for it. It was incredibly validating to hear this, and it drove my passion onward. But at the same time, I found that 
there was another side of this debate here. There was something else that people were discussing within the school. For these people, fear was still seen as a viable way to change health behavior within individuals. For them, the question wasn't, how do we eliminate fear? For them, the question was, how scared do we want to make people? Now, I think that's a really great question if you are trying to design a haunted house. But I don't necessarily know that we want a public health campaign or a doctor's office to feel like Friday the 13th. It was very confusing to me because this seemed to be all in contrast to everything that I was learning within my classrooms. And then I saw this. This is on the subway. It was all over the community. It's the It's Never Just HIV campaign, a fear-based message campaign meant to target men who have sex with men that was introduced by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And this confused me further because this was absolutely against everything I was learning. And it was shocking to me on a personal level because while I knew that this was meant to make these men afraid of a virus, I couldn't tell if that fearful look that he had on, that, on his face was fear that he had for someone like me, someone living with HIV. For me, I believe that this sort of negativity shuts down conversations precisely at the moment that we need to have them. I believe that this sort of fearful message drives this epidemic into a different place in our community. That those of us who are the experts, that when we are able to have trusting, honest, open conversations with the populations that we seek to serve, that we become experts that can help them and help guide them through uncertainty. It's absolutely difficult. It's incredibly difficult to protect ourselves from HIV in so many of these communities. I know because I talk to people about this. I talk about condom use on a community level. And I know that for almost everyone that I talk with, that it's not a simple behavior. It's not simple to understand how to protect yourself. And unfortunately, these types of messages send out the idea that if you are unable to protect yourself, if you're unable to get your risk down to zero, that you may be stupid, you may be irresponsible, and you may on some level be a bad person. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me run to my doctor to talk about this honestly. This doesn't make me want to talk with someone in public health or a social worker. This makes me want to shut down and turn to my friends and listen to their rumors and listen to their legends around how to minimize their risk. And that doesn't necessarily help things, now does it? I know this talk is about HIV, but I actually believe that it can go further. And I believe that we have to talk about it right now because right now, here in New York, we have a number of campaigns, whether it be smoking, obesity, or teen pregnancy, where we are talking right now about using fear and shame to change so many behaviors. But the problem with all of this is that the research is absolutely mixed. There's nothing showing definitively that these campaigns are going to be able to change behaviors. The problem with that is that one thing we can be sure about is that these types of campaigns and shame-based conversations that we may have with clinicians don't make people feel good about themselves. It absolutely makes them feel as though they too might be bad. I believe that there is a better way to do this. I believe that by promoting positive energy, that we can actually grow these conversations that we need to have, that we can help people build these connections with their healthcare workers, that they can build it with public health experts, and that they can have the discussions that they need to have. We can disseminate knowledge, and we can connect people to resources in a better way. Some of you might remember this campaign. This is an anti-smoking campaign that came out a few years ago called the Truth Campaign. And in a very innovative way, it treated the dissemination of information and the connection to resources as some sort of activist campaign that was inclusive of everyone, not just people who don't smoke, but people who do smoke. It brought people together and built that conversation. I believe that this is the type of energy, the type of messaging that we need in order to make differences in these very complex health behaviors. 
It's not that fear and shame aren't motivating. They absolutely are. Those of us who study at Columbia University understand this. <laughs> don't we? Yeah, we do. If I don't finish this paper on time, I won't get the grade that I need in class, and then I won't be able to graduate, and then I'll never get a job, and then I'll never be able to pay off my student loans, and that will motivate you. <laughs> that will motivate you. But it's a poor substitute for far better motivators, such as passion or compassion, honesty, love, bravery, understanding. These are the things that will drive us forward even more so and will truly give us the response that we want longer and with less side effects. I believe that health is more than just the absence of disease. I believe that health is mental health. I believe that health is happiness. I believe that health is well-being. And if that's true, then these types of campaigns may very well do more to harm health than help health. Now, I hope that everyone leaves here today with a few questions in mind of the role that fear and shame should play in any of our healthcare initiatives. But if you still don't believe me, I have brought in an expert. That is a picture of Yoda. <laughs> and I will leave you all to read the quote, but I dare you all to argue with the Jedi Master. <laughs> Thank you so much.